previously on the Word of God through Jesus so, Christ. Uh, I'd just like to ask you to stay with me, have your Bibles, grab a pen or two, some paper to take notes, because you, you're really going to want to uh, remember this and examine this later. Always examine your notes in your time with God to make sure that the word that you're hearing is coming straight out of the word of God and not out of anyone's own interpretation, thoughts, or ideas, or philosophies, for that matter. Okay? Last night, the title was Move Out of the Way. It's not over yet. And God is speaking in reference to the judgment that has went out over this nation. Tonight, right now, the title for this discussion is simply called Watch Out for the Bait and Switch because we're really not in this all together. There's too many people trying to operate without God. And it's kind of funny because I'm sitting back, not just me, but other apostles, my, my male brothers that are apostles, because in the Bible, apostles are men. In the Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible, if you go into the Greek dictionary and you look up number 652, the word is apostolus, which is made up of apple and stello, uh, and it says, it gives a definition, but the last one is he that is sent. It said nothing about them. And don't say, well, that's because it's universal. No, because where it's, where it's a female gender in the Bible, it says female. And where it's a male gender in the Bible, it says male. It says God created, in the image of God created he him, that meant Adam. Male and female created he them. Then he divided up the image. When he spoke of prophets in scripture in the Old Testament, they were called Nabi. When he spoke of prophetesses, they was called Nebiyah. There was a difference in the language. Now, when it comes to the office of evangelists, soul winners, those that witness unto Jesus Christ, that spread the good news, we all can do that, male or female. It doesn't matter. In the office of pastor in the New Testament and even in the old, you don't read about a priestess. You don't read about a female priest. Even in the New Testament, you don't read about that because it doesn't exist. It's time to line up with the word and stop trying to do all this stuff apart from God. Because if you look at what's going on now, no one is able on their own accolade. To stop this plague, this pandemic that happens to be running crazy all over this earth. People are so scared, again, that they're walking around like this. And now back to our program. the word of God through Jesus Christ street and outreach ministry raw and uncut productions
Uh, perfect time for the word. And watch this. Don't get caught up in the theatrics, but get caught up in the word. And now, to the Word of God, through Jesus Christ, with Apostle Alan E. Coleman, Jr., God bless you, and enjoy the message. In the office of pastor in the New Testament, and even in the Old, you don't read about a priestess. You don't read about a female priest. Even in the New Testament, you don't read about that because it doesn't exist. It's time to line up with the word and stop trying to do all this stuff apart from God. Because if you look at what's going on now, no one is able on their own accolade. To stop this plague, this pandemic that happens to be running crazy all over this earth. People are so scared, again, that they're walking around like this. That demonstrates no power. <laughs> now on the news... They're talking about the hand sanitizer not being good for you. They're talking about there was a recall on certain hand sanitizer. Watch out for the bait and switch. Moses, Aaron, and even Miriam. I don't know where she was right here because I don't see her name. All of them and the rest of Israel came out of Egypt together. They came out on the same page. They, they came out on one accord. Now we get to number 16, chapter 16, yet verse 3, it mentions that Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and An, and 250 popular leaders, influential if you will, world-renowned, all members of the assembly, that's what that means, world-renowned, they all were involved, and they went to Moses and Aaron, all of these people went to two men that God called, mind you, that God put in place to lead these people out of bondage, the prophet to lead them out, the pastor to assist him. <laughs> Why? Because the prophet needs to spend time with God and get constant instruction as the prophetess would do. But the pastor, the priest, his job, his responsibility, what's required of him is to guard the sheep. It's funny how when Moses went on the mountain to talk to God, how Aaron, they, they had Aaron build them that golden calf. It goes to tell you how weak some pastors are. Anyway, in verse 3 of Numbers 16, they went to Moses and Aaron and said, We have had enough of your presumption, your arrogant, arrogance. We've had enough of you trying to be the bomb, trying to tell us what to do. You are no better than anyone else. Everyone in Israel has been chosen of the Lord, and he is with 
all of us. The 26 years that I have been an apostle, I have, I, God has never allowed me to be one of those apostles with my nose up in the air. I'm from the streets. Before I got saved, I sold drugs. Wait. I'm not talking about no little skimpy $2 things. I sold weight. I did other things in the world. I never did crack. I did used to smoke weed a half ounce a day. <laughs> and it wasn't garbage either. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> When I was out there in the world, plus I taught martial arts. I'm, I'm a master of Kung Fu of over 12 different animal styles. And also having a black belt in Tong Sudo, which is a Korean karate. And a couple of other forms of martial science or martial arts under my belt. So when I was in the world, I did things, okay? And then when the Lord saved me, actually in 1984, no, yeah, 84, I fell, and then I came back to the Lord in 87 when my father got ready to die. He died of cancer when I was 21. Then I fell again, and then in 1990, I came back to God wholeheartedly and stayed. And I was told by a prophetess, an older prophetess, she's going on to be with the Lord now. I pray that's where she went. I'm sure she did. But she said unto me, Alan, the Lord is going to use you to teach and preach the gospel. And when she told me this, at the time, I had a bag of weed in my pocket and a beer in my hand. I've shared this testimony many times. So I didn't understand how is God going to use me to teach and preach anything when I'm living this way. Well, after that word by the prophetess was put out in the earth realm, things began to happen in my life. I had one of the most secure, one of the, a very secure job. I used to work at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital. I ended up hurting my back on the job. So from that moment on, things started happening in my life to push me toward God. You, you'll see where I'm going in a minute. Once the Lord allowed these things to push me to him. In 1994, I was in jail for preaching because from 1990 to 1993, I had been shaped by God. I went down in the water, of course, in Jesus' name, to prove or to, to symbolize that I turned from a life of sin. And when I did that, I was going to Bible study, going to services. God had me going here, there, here, there, here, there. The different place. And I didn't know he was leading me and why. But he was leading me to where truth was this day and truth was that day and truth was that day. And he would let me go home and anoint me to study and to examine scripture to see if what I was being told was in the word. So by 1993... I was saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And the Lord sent me out to go visit some ministries in my city. He said, I'll show you what ministries to go to. Now, it's important to understand, if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, you usually have to go to people to hear what the Lord is saying. People that are already in leadership. But once the Lord fills you with himself, once he lives in you, once you're filled with the Holy Ghost for real, and I'm not talking about chanting and ba 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 no, I ain't talking about all that garbage. But once you're filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in unlearned tongues, that you can't copy, that you can't practice and rehearse, that you can't in, uh, uh, imitate or nothing. Once you get there, then you don't need to go to no man or no woman and say, what is the Lord saying? Because the Lord then is able to commune with you, to talk with you. To reveal to you the gifts that he has for you. There's the ministry gift that he will have for you if indeed you're called into 
one of the fivefold. Those are ministry gifts. And then there's spiritual gifts that operate the ministry gifts. So, in 1994, I had been used by God even right before then to minister to people and minister to an individual specifically as well. And because of preaching, I ended up in prison. I shared this testimony many times also. And when the Lord allowed the enemy to put me in there, I said, Lord, why? I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm following you. Why am I in here? I ain't do nothing wrong. You said to minister. The court said don't minister. But you said to minister. I got to follow you. Why am I in here? And God said simply, you know me. Now let me show you your enemy. And that he has power. So now God started teaching me that all these graves in the graveyard, he was not responsible for none of that. Because when he made male and female, it wasn't his will or desire for us to ever leave, to die, for our soul to separate from our body. Yet it happened because of rebellion and disobedience. He said, I'm not responsible for none of that. He showed me the hospitals. He said, I'm not responsible for none of those sicknesses. Though I am sovereign and everything has to obey me when I speak, I am not responsible for those sicknesses in the hospital. I'm not responsible for the sicknesses that are taking people's lives. Oh, we're still going somewhere. I don't think we're off the subject. We're still right here on verse 3 of chapter 16 of Numbers. But I'm led by the Holy Ghost to share this. So, uh, he allowed me to be put in prison by the enemy. And when I got in there, and I was transferred to the prison, I was sentenced to 13 months. But I had already been getting arrested for ministering anyway. So... I had some good time accumulated, <laughs> praise God. Because when they said 13 months, I was like, oh my goodness, me, I can't do, Lord, this ain't me. Because I was under the impression that the Christian walk is peachy keen, that it's easy, that everything just goes your way because you're a Christian. I read what Jesus said, if the world hates you, remember it hate me first. I read that. I read where the Lord said that you will be uh, persecuted and all of that. I read all of that. But now here it was coming into play in my life. It was a hard pill to swallow. But I learned in that, that when God is dealing with you, you cannot go to the left or to the right. You can't shake them off. You can't elbow them out the way. You can't throw no kick. You can't throw no punch. You can't do anything. But you have to just do what God tells you to do. Especially when he's the Lord of your life. So here I was. In prison. The COs said to me, after I had been there for a couple of months, oh, we know you're real. We done read your jacket. We know why you're in here. We, we know we've been watching you. We know that you're real. So I began to experience favors, like being locked in the school by myself so I could study. I asked them a couple of times to put me in a hole. They said no, because you would enjoy it. I said, I sure would, so I can have quiet time with God. <laughs> but God set me as pastor in that place. Because before I got in there, I made a vow to the Lord. When he sent me around to those ministries to go talk to those ministers, while I was in the preparation stage, the ministries he sent me to the doors were closed. And the Holy Ghost said unto me, my house should be open. 
Then I went to a minister to talk, a, a bishop, he's dead now, and the Lord let me to say to him, I have a spiritual problem, and I told him what it was, the devil tearing up my house, and the man put his hand on his mouth and said, oh, well, I got to go to a meeting, he looked at his watch and said, I got to go to a meeting, set up an appointment with my secretary for next week, I told him I need help now. He said, next week. You know I didn't go back. But when I walked out the door of that ministry, I looked straight ahead across the street and I saw open vision. But I, I, I was led to say, Lord, if you ever call me in ministry, I'd be there for your people 24 hours, seven days a week. Because I needed help and couldn't get none. And that's not, and I come from a long line of ministers. So while I was in the world, I used to see cousins and relatives of mine always in the house of God or in the place of worship. And I would feel convicted when I were around them because I knew I was brought up one way and yet here I was living another. So when the Lord brought me in him and I was studying and fellowshipping and all that, the, the family didn't see me. They were barred out of my trial. <laughs> so when I was in prison and the COs said, we know you're real. One night as, I was, as it was getting close to my release, because I only did five months, out of the 13 I was sentenced to. One night I was standing out in the backyard. It was at night. We was out there for wreck. They used to smoke cigarettes in prison. No, well, no, the cigarettes, they had stopped the smoking of cigarettes. But we were outside getting some air, I guess. The Holy Ghost, now I had, again, been pastoring. The moment I stepped in that prison, I went Friday night, so on Saturday morning when I went outside and my foot hit the asphalt, I heard the Holy Ghost say unto me, I am going to send men to you and I'm going to use you to teach them the deep things of God. And I was like, wow. Because see, I never had done this before. I said, oh, wow. And as I walked, there was a, an Italian brother who was sitting on a bench and he was reading the Bible and my property was still... Uh, 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 being processed, I guess. So my Bible was there because when I went and, and, and went into the court and got arrested, I went in there with Bible tracts and everything, books, uh, pads and all that. I went in there ready to whatever God wanted me to do. And that's when he blessed me to write my first sermon from 1 Samuel 17 called Be All You Can Be in the Army of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So anyway, this brother, when I walked by, he he was the only one sitting out there on a picnic table, and he said, he asked me my name. I said, my name is Alan. He said, my name is uh, Frank, a good friend of mine, good friend. He actually became my uh, second son's godfather and my daughter's godfather. Um, he's, he's deceased now, but he was sitting there reading the Bible, and he asked me, he said, could you tell me what this scripture means? And I said, what is it? He didn't, see, he didn't even know me. And he started reading. And while he was reading, I was walking back and forth, getting lined up in prayer. Lord, forgive me for my sins. That's the first thing. God's going to forgive you for your sins. You can't just talk to God and you got sin blocking your way because he ain't hearing that. So, Lord, forgive me for my sins. First John 1 and 9. Forgive me for my sins and shortcomings and faults and wrongs. And give me understanding of this word. I don't know what he's going to ask, but, Lord, allow me to answer. Blah, 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 blah. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So when he read it, then the Lord led me to explain it to him. And as he le led me to explain it to him, I was pacing back and forth talking as the Lord was giving it to me. But I wasn't aware of what was going on at that table. And then when they rung the bell and it was time for us to go in and eat, when I looked up, that table was full of men. Praise the Lord. We're still on verse 3. We're walking right up there. So w when when... Later on, that was only one of the many exploits that was done in that prison as the Lord used me. 
And as pastor, I mean, I, the, the administration challenge told me don't preach no more. The warden said don't preach. I went on a protest. I just fasted. The protest meaning I sat by the door of the place, anointed it with oil, and wouldn't eat or nothing until they opened that door. And they ended up doing it. The choir was practicing outside in the meantime. It was, so, oh, you just don't understand. Don't think that the Lord is not in them prisons because he is. He's even more in there than out here. So I, 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 before, when, as I was saying, there was a night when close to my release time, and I was standing out there, and the Lord said, look up. And I looked. He said, look at the moon. Where is the moon? And I said, Lord, it's right there behind that cloud, because I could see the, 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 the rays of the moon. And the Lord said, reach your hand forward. And I did. And, you know, he said, reach your hand. He told me what hand. He just led my hand. I did. He said, and say, moon, in the name of Jesus, come from behind that cloud. And he said, move your hand that way. And I did it. And the moon came out. And I said, oh, wow. And he said, no, no, that's nothing. Because the devil could try to say, since the earth rotate on the axis, that's what's causing it to be done. Because, you know, the clouds move and all of that. The Lord said, now put your hand back up there and say, in the name of Jesus, moon, go back behind the cloud. And I said, just that, move my hand that way. And it went back behind the cloud. I was like, oh, my goodness. And the Lord said unto me, if you believe my word as it is written and you operate according to my word, don't work the word because that's manipulation. But if you submit to my word, if you capitulate to my word, then you will get what my word says. So I said, wow. And there was a brother that came over, a friend of mine, his name is Anthony. And he used to call me Moses, and I used to call him Joshua. And he came over to me, and he said, Moses, what are you doing? I saw that. I said, you saw that? He said, yeah. He said, I could do it too. Watch. Moon in, in Jesus' name. He said it that way. In Jesus' name, come out from behind the cloud. Nothing happened. And he said, wow, I guess it wasn't for me to do. So then when the Lord released me, when he opened that door for me to be released and I came out, I came out with power. I came out stronger in the Lord. I had been studying theology and, and teaching theology and, and starting to study Hebrew and Greek and everything. God was doing his thing. So when I came out, I came out with fire. So now, 26 years later, and within this 26 years, there's been people God used me to talk to. Now we're back on verse 3. People he used me to talk to, and they assume because God don't let me be stuck up and with my nose in the air and looking like a Catholic priest uh, like most, like the denominations do, because I'm not on that page and won't be, but instead a man of God that's dangerous because I have credentials uh, and can go in the building and got credentials to set up places of worship. When I walk in a place of worship, if I choose to go to the pulpit, I can. And if those people say no, well, then that's on them. But I have the right to. Because in the earth realm, they only go by paper. Yet, I'm a street minister at heart. Can go out in the field and win souls and can go in the building and be used by God to cultivate the gift of leaders. So when God send me to ministries here or anywhere that he sends me to a ministry, I'm not going in there to sit down. My question to the Lord is why are you sending me here? And it's because there's something he want me to see. Either they're just opening and they need to know how to line up or they've been operating and about to close and they're in the red and they need to hear from the Lord. So watch this. So as an apostle, we, we, we apostles, us men, brothers, y'all understand this. We are the only ones in the body of Christ that, in the fivefold ministry that walks in all four of the other offices. If you put the apostle, I mean the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and teacher together, out comes the apostle. So uh, 
uh, the Lord led me. He led me to go out. And, and when he leads me to go and minister or to go visit other ministries, if the ministry is getting ready to close and they're in the red, he'll send me there as a prophet. If the ministry is operating powerfully and they're in, 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 not in the red, but they're lined up with God, but yet the seats are empty, he'll use me as an evangelist and show the pastor, this is how you go get the sheep. Because while they're telling y'all sheep beget sheep, that's a doggone lie. The truth of the matter is shepherds beget sheep. They have to go get sheep. You don't see no sheep going out there getting other sheep. It don't go that way. How it, they wouldn't know how to do it because sheep try to impress the leader. So if the leader is trying to be prestigious, the sheep try to be that way. And they go out in the field and see a prostitute or somebody drinking or somebody on crack or somebody with a needle in their arm. And they condemn them and beat them up. And not even they might even see a gay person beat them up and all of that and, 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 and make it seem like there's no room for them in heaven. But that's not the truth because an evangelist will go out there with a message. The evangelist don't change nobody. The apostle don't change nobody. The prophet don't change nobody. The pastor don't change nobody. The prophetess don't change nobody. The teacher don't change nobody. But the message that we have does the work. Now, if a person hears the word and they don't want to go by it, then it's a problem. So when they walked up to Moses and Aaron and said, we have had enough of your presumption. You are no better than anyone else. That, that's the point. All that the Lord let me just share concerning part of my testimony. When the Lord lead me to fellowship with people that are not where I'm at, when God start using me where he has me, then I, I've heard that too. Who do you think you are? I got this kind of ministry and that kind of ministry too. I got a nonprofit. I got, and see, that, here's where the ignorance come in. You got? The name of this ministry is the Word of God through Jesus Christ Street and Outreach Ministry. Type it in your search engine if you have a computer. The Word of God through Jesus Christ Street and Outreach Ministry. Not street and, but street in the ampersand on your seven key. Type it in and see all of the hits you get about this ministry. The word of God through Jesus Christ. My name is not on the ministry. Now, when you look at the website, it says that I am an underseer. Oh, glory. I'm, uh, because the overseer is God. He's the bishop of our souls. And bishop means overseer. Just like pastor means overseer. Same thing. So, it, those of you, the Lord is leading me to say this. Those of you who are the chosen one in the family, and God is using you to hold your family up in prayer, to hold them on your shoulder, to intercede for them, to cry for them when God show you that they are about to be in a trial. When they look at you and say, you're no better than me. You're not going to be able to argue with them because I found that when you begin to run down the things God used you to do, either they're going to compete with you or they're going to tell you that they don't believe you. Or they're going to get intimidated and then try to blackboard you not want to be around you. I got a lot of cousins that are ministers. That are, high, <laughs> that are ministers, and some that are hirelings. Yes, that's true. But you think I could get a speaking engagement? No. Why? Because it is. See, the more truth you teach, people, a lot of leaders, have this idea that it's all about them. So just like here, they said to Moses, 250 plus Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and An, they said to Moses and Aaron, you are no better than anyone else. Everyone in Israel has been chosen of the Lord, and he is with all of us. Well, if he was with all of them, then why did they go through the attack that they went through? 
What attack? Well, when they said that, what right do you have to put yourselves forward claiming that we must obey you and acting as though you were greater than anyone else among all these people of the Lord? Verse 4, when Moses heard what they were saying, he fell face downward to the ground. Intercession. He went before the Lord. The chosen vessel goes before the Lord. Don't argue with your family. Don't argue with your children. Don't argue with your spouse. Don't argue at your job. Go before the Lord. If you're a prophet and a prophetess, then you understand that you are a worshiper and an intercessor. And a prayer warrior. Evangelists are not prayer warriors. A prayer warrior are those of the prophetic anointing. Evangelists are miracle workers. And God used them to do healings. And they are praisers. They will praise God. They will woo God with their praise. Oh, God, you're so good. Oh, Lord, I thank you for the way you do this and do that. I thank you for the way you woke up. Uh, an evangelist will pray and just praise God all through the prayer and get on his good side. <laughs> Yet a prophet and a prophetess, they go before God with worship. They're on the quiet side. They also are psalmists. Mm -hmm. Whoa, Lord. In time of trouble, I know you said, Lord, you would stand by me. And when I'm in trouble, Lord have mercy, when I've got misery, come on Lord, stand, come on and stand by me, prophets and prophetesses, they go before him, beckoning, and when this journey has ended and i know the role of light when the role of light has come to an end you know that i i come on into the judgment i want to be welcome to be welcome, oh Lord, my crown on my head, hey Lord, come on, oh Jesus, and I know you can ease, ease my troubled mind they come before the Lord and worship prophets and prophetesses do and after they worship him after they talk to him they wait they wait for him to respond they won't move <laughs> But they'll wait for him to respond. When Moses heard what they were saying, he fell face downward to the ground. Now, don't say this right before verse 5, what God used me to say. But those of you of the prophetic anointing, you'll understand this by revelation. He heard God. In verse 5, he got up and he said to Korah and to those who were with him, In the morning, 
The Lord will show you who are his. See, he didn't argue. He didn't say, I'm going to show you. I'm going to tell you who I traveled with. I'm going to tell you who my leader was. I'm going to, he didn't say all that because Moses' leader was God. So there was no one in the earth realm that he could give any credit to for who he was. So he said, in the morning, the Lord will show you who are his. All this coronavirus residue that's plaguing this nation. Who is going to God about this? Who is on their face about this? Surely not the governors. Because they don't know God. They're all in a race like rats trying to see who could be the greatest. Surely the mayors don't know because they all are trying to govern the city. Everyone's on a power trip. They said in the beginning, we're all in this together, but we're not in this together. One minute they're saying wear a mask. The next minute they say don't. Then they say, some mayors say, for the city, wear a mask even when you walk outside. So now you got a whole bunch of people walking around like this. Sometimes you walk up on people and they say, hey, how you doing? How you been? And you look at them and go, who in the world are you? Could you move the mask? Oh, okay. Hey, what's going on? It's, it's crazy. Moses said, and he didn't just say in the morning the Lord will show you who are his and who is holy and whom he has chosen as his priest. He said, verse 6, do this, you, Korah, and all those with you. Take censers tomorrow and light them and put incense upon them before the Lord. And we will find out whom the Lord has chosen. You are the presumptuous ones, you sons of Levi. So I thought the Lord let me tell a pastor in a minute. When he sent me to a ministry, and because the pastor, the ministry is about to close. They're in the red. Ain't nobody in the seats. And they got nerve to be standing up there like they preaching our heart. And no one's being drawn in. And they try to, I got this. No, you're not. You're only a pastor. Sit down. Sit down. See, apostles can say that. We could stand toe to toe with a pastor. We could stand toe to toe with a prophet and a prophetess. We could stand toe to toe with an evangelist. We could stand toe to toe even with a teacher. And if a, another apostle is in the wrong, we could stand toe to toe with him. I will not associate or get in covenant with an apostle, whether he's called or not, that will ordain a woman as apostle or acknowledge one as such. That's a click. I'm not getting in there. Why? Because it's not scripture. So when you, when, when, when you are lined up with the word and God is using you to teach nothing but the word, then you become the oddball and people walk up to you and say, who do you think you are? Who are you to judge? No one. This is. This is the handbook. This is the sword of the spirit. And this is what you chop the devil up with. He knew it. That's why in Matthew 4, when Jesus was led by the Holy Ghost, that flesh was led by the Holy Ghost in the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted by the devil. The devil said, if you be the son of God. But in the Greek, it says, since you be the son of God. He knew who Jesus was. And when he saw Jesus in the wilderness, the devil said, uh-oh. I'm not going to be able to just challenge him and ask him, what does the word say? Because this is the word. I got to come different with him. See, when you're at a different level in ministry, the enemy has to even bother you in a different way. If you compromise, he ain't got to do nothing but throw stuff from the world at you. Women who are involved with men. Women in ministry, mind you, 
prophetesses or evangelists or women that are teachers of the gospel who get involved with men that are not men of God. They're not saved. I saw that even on social media. There was a bunch of women with all kind of God this and God that and God this on their Facebook page. And yet they had a picture of a man all muscular with a whole bunch of dreads. And they talking about, mm, can I borrow him? One lady who posted it said, oh, that's why I left him out there because he's been borrowed by others. And, so, and, and I, wrote, I couldn't go by that. I wrote and said, what in the world is wrong with y'all? Y'all said with your mouth, Lord, Lord, but you're writing man, man. Sisters want to get all tattooed up and all pierced up and they say, I'm a woman of God. No, you're not. That's bondage. That's demonic. Let me say it this way. That is demoniacal residue to get tattoos. You're branding yourself. Like they do cattle. Branded. This cow belongs to me. This horse belongs to me. When you get tattoos, that's just what you're saying. This is what owns you. The tattoo. On your neck. On your face. On your other parts of your body. Piercing everywhere. All kind of areas on your body. That's torture. That's, that's, that's doing stuff that God said don't do that he said don't and look at look in the law look at the Old Testament he said do not pierce yourself don't cut yourself don't tattoo yourself show me apostle God could use me to show you you see all these books oh there's all kind of live books around me God can use me to show you where the scripture is but will you listen no some of you say, well, I already got them. Well, cover them up. Don't go in the house. Well, the house of God is, well, the, the place of worship that they call the house of God is closed now because the governor said close it or the mayor said close it. No, don't say Donald Trump said it because he didn't. He ain't said it. But the mayor and the governor said close it. Don't sing in the place of worship. So now they're telling you be quiet. Some of you Listen, the only reason the enemy is able to do this against the places of worship is because there's a lot of people that's involved in ministry work who got dirty hands, been in a club all week long, be home drinking and smoking and getting high and fornicating and orgying and everything else. Some gay, some lesbian, all this stuff. And they come in this place of worship and say, yes, Lord, no, you don't stop. Moses said, do this, you, Korah, and all those with you, take censers tomorrow and light them, and put incense upon them before the Lord, and we will find out whom the Lord has chosen. You are the presumptuous ones, you sons of Levi, you priests, you, you descendants of priests, is what he's saying. Well, why didn't he, why didn't they have the battle right then? Sometimes God is giving you a chance. It's called grace. A grace period. To stop your foolishness. To come out of your sin. To let God change you. A lot of people have forfeit their blessing, and then when they forfeit it, they want to try to hold on to it. It's too late. Sometimes it's too late, especially if it's been a, a long period, and God kept warning and warning and warning and warning. After a while, it's too late. It's too late. Well, what God has for me is mine. Well, if that's the way you look at it, then why did you goof it up? Why did you cheat on that wife, brother, if you really love her? Mm -mm. Why did you argue with your husband, sister, and tell him to get out, or better yet, why did you leave if you loved him? So now, brother, your wife done woke up, and you've been 
abusing her long enough. She's tired. She done went before God. And God said, on many occasions, I'm going to bring you out if he don't let me clean him up. You, sister, God have put you in a covenant, gave you to a man of God. Now this message is for the ministers, the female ministers. And you've been putting him through so much, acting like a daughter of Jezebel, wanting to argue, fight, fuss, lie, hold your nose up in the air, thinking that you're the last creation of a female man. And God kept giving you chances. He sent warnings to you by dreams. It's not his fault you don't understand your dreams. He sent warnings to you by visions. It's not God's fault that you don't have the gift of interpreting visions. He sent the word. He was faithful. And those that are in the pulpit, whose marriages are kaput now, you've been handling the word. You didn't see where the word was talking to you. And so then you forfeit. And you say, I want back what God gave to me. You might have blew it. And if you did, the bad part is just like with Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and on. They had 250 people around them. Well, these men were men of renown. Very influential. It says in the King James Version. And you're trying to tell me that not one of them could say, you brothers are in the wrong. Y'all going against the prophet that God raised up. Don't you remember how God used him to go to Pharaoh? <laughs> Uh, don't you remember how God used him to intercede for us and fight on our behalf and stand for us? You don't remember all that? There was no one there to say that. Instead, they sided with Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and on. It was a click. See, if you're not in the click, then you're the one think you better than anybody because you won't go with status quo. If you don't accept homosexuals being in the ministry, then you're homophobic. <laughs> That's what they say. If you don't accept a wife that's all tattooed and pierced up, then you're judging her. If you don't Except the husband that's cheating and smacking you around and lying to you and bringing you STDs. Then some broken down pastor tell you, well, you know you can't divorce him. You can't leave out of your marriage. Because the Bible says, and they have no understanding of the scripture. Jesus said in Matthew 19, divorce was not so. Right, it wasn't supposed to be. He said, but because of the hardness of your heart. See, there's things God know that we can't take, that we can't accept. No woman should be able to accept a man smacking her around like she's a piece of rag. No man should have to stand there and accept a woman putting her son before her husband or putting her parents before her husband. No man should take that. If he's the head of the household, woman of God, and you know he is, then why are you putting other people ahead of him? You lying wonder. Verse 8, then Moses spoke again to Korah. Does it seem a small thing to you that the God of Israel has chosen you from among all the people of Israel to be near to himself as you work in the tabernacle of Jehovah and to stand before the people to minister to them? 
Is this a small thing? No. No. This is great responsibility. It's a great honor and it's a blessing that the Lord should have me in position to teach his word. Not only teach it, but to be able to read it and understand it. The hardest book in the world. And be able to relay in simple terms what this hard book is saying. Or when people call the ministry for prayer, 475 300 3850, 24 hours. They call the ministry for prayer. And the Lord can use me to pray for them effectively. And then to hear them get back to me and say, Praise God because the prayer worked. That's an honor. Is that a small thing? No. And, and not only is it not a small thing, but it requires commitment. Not only does it require commitment, but it requires an anointing. The anointing from the anointed one. I tell you, that's, that was a powerful show. That was really, really, really a powerful show. Join us the next time when the Lord leads us to go back in the scripture with some more information. Maybe it'll be with one of my friends. Maybe it'll be just me. I don't know. Either way, the Lord will be orchestrating the lesson. God bless you. And take care. <laughs> Till the next time. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just thank you for all that I have in you. And all that you are in my life. For all that you've done for thy servant. Lord, you're just so wonderful. You're just so wonderful. I can't think of how else my life would be without you. As long as I have Jesus, I have a satisfied mind. This is my prayer. Sometimes I don't have food on my table. I'm glad, I'm glad I know someone. And it
did you say you had? Sad is my mind. When friends forsake you, sad is my mind. When my mother and my father let me down, sad I got to my mind. What did you say? Sad.